Welcome to Oplum Plaza Talks, created by the Hispanic Theological Initiative. Each episode focuses on a topic that matters to you, whether you're in the field, the academy, or the clergy. Today we bring you a conversation between Dr. Tony Alonso, Dr. Ted Smith, and Lucila Crena about theological education between the times. For more information about today's episode, please visit us at htiopenplaza.org. Hello, friends, and welcome to this episode of Open Plaza. I'm Tony Alonso, Assistant Professor of Theology and Culture at Candler School of Theology at Emory University. And I have the privilege of hosting this conversation with two of my amazing Candler colleagues and good friends of HTI, Ted Smith and Lucila Crena, about their work on theological education between the times, a project centered on the meanings and purposes of theological education. Ted is professor of preaching and ethics at Candler and the director of the project. And Lucila is instructor of theology, ethics and culture at Candler and serves as the project's managing editor. Lucila and Ted, welcome. Thanks, Tony. It's great to be here. Happy to be here. I've I've poured myself a cafecito for this conversation (laughs) and I'm looking forward to uh, learning from both of you. Now, because uh, TEBT, as we like to call it, is committed to exploring a diverse world of thoughts about theological education, this is actually the first of several episodes that will feature a range of folks, many close and familiar friends of HTI, reflecting on these same questions from their own perspectives. And uh, full disclosure, I was blessed to be a part of this work at its infancy a few years ago. So it's a special gift to continue learning about its flourishing in the present. And I know, Ted, that word is out about theological education between the times for many of our listeners, but especially for the benefit of those who haven't yet heard of this work. Could you just kind of set up how this work came to be and explain what it consists of? You know, I think some of the deepest roots of this, at least uh, not not programmatically, but more personally, came from my being at in multiple situations where people I really respected were worrying about theological education. And then uh, even with these deeply theological folks, Uh, the language always drifted into a managerial register. And so it became about market share, boosting enrollment, new degree programs, um, new modes of accreditation. It was was all in the realm of management. And um, I felt, I just felt some compunction around that. I mean, I was part of those conversations too. And I thought, we, we just need some fresh thinking about what all this is for, um, why we're doing it at all. So that's, that's part of the where it grows out of for me is to get people thinking critically and theologically about what this whole thing is for, um, not just how to do it. Um, so the, the very, it's, it's started, as you know, I mean, you were a doctoral student, so <laughs> it's a long time ago. Um, but that first phase was really a phase of listening. We had maybe 60, almost 60 people from the US, the UK, Brazil, Canada uh, gathered uh, in five little consultations around the country. Um, and we tried to have the kind, because, because where you meet shapes who gets to speak, you know, it really matters. So we met and what you can think so we met in these really different places. We met at Saddleback uh, Community Church in Orange County. We met at Candler. We met at Mundelein Seminary in Chicagoland. We met at Howard Divinity School in DC. And we met at Esperanza College uh, in Philadelphia. And the places were uh, educations in themselves, but so too were the people who were there. There was no majority race in that first group. Um, and the just the, the pluralism was palpable. So a lot of that first part was just trying to hear who's out there, uh, hear what people are doing, what people are thinking. And then this the second part, uh, the second phase was to gather a small group of just 12 people, each of whom uh, is wrote or is writing a book 
for a series. And we wanted the books to be not big overviews of theological education, but kind of spiky and particular from particular locations in particular voices. And people have really come through with that. It's a, it's a remarkable group of people. I, I really count it as one of the blessings of my life to get to share that time with them. Um, and it's worth. Can I just tell you who they are? It's worth. Please give us give us the. We're litany. saying their names. I mean, yeah. it's a it's a remarkable remarkable group of friends and colleagues. Dan Ailshire, uh recently retired from the Association of Theological Schools. And Elizabeth Conde Frazier uh, of Ayat now of Esperanza College when she started, Carrie Day of Bright Divinity School, or, I mean now of Princeton Seminary, uh, Willie Jennings of Yale, Mark Jordan of Harvard Divinity School, Colleen Mary Mallon, uh, a Dominican sister now based in California, Hoffman Espino of Boston College, Chloe Sun of Logos Seminary, Maria Leo Wong of City Seminary, Amos Young of Fuller, and Mark Young, the president of Denver Theological Seminary. So a really remarkable range of people, but uh, what really set it apart, I think, is the just these individual lives and uh, who they are. So we met seven times over a couple of years and wrote books together, uh, worshiped together, shared a lot of big moves in our lives together. And now the books are coming out. And that's phase three, phase three that it, we're right in the middle of. Um, it wasn't, it's not really just kind of rolling out the books. It's letting the books be part of a conversation that's now expanding again, um, sparking new, kind, new conversations that are deeply contextual where they are. Um, so I hope we can start like hundreds of little wildfires of theological reflection on theological education and let the books books be part of that and let them be interconnected. So the very first thing we had to do in phase three was to hire somebody who was who could have that vision and could see all of that and then would know how to connect with these communities and also engage in the theological reflection herself. So uh, I knew right away uh, that I was hoping Lucila would say yes to that and she did. And so here we are. So you looked for the best and you found the best and the best said yes. Uh, oh, you uh, too. Tell us, tell us a bit. Oh, he was talking about when he was admitted to Emory's doctoral program. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, got it. Absolutely <laughs> not. No, no, no. He was not. And about you. But yes, I've done it a couple of times now. Yes. <laughs> So Lucila, tell us a bit about what drew you to this project. I mean, I assume, you know, you have lots of things you could be doing with your time and, and you seem really engaged by this work. What drew you to it? What's exciting you about it? What are you learning from it? Yeah, thanks for that question, Tony. Um, as I was preparing for this conversation, I pulled up the document that captivated me, that where I said, if I have a chance, this is where I want to spend the, um, the next few years. Um, and that is the proposal, the phase three proposal uh, that Ted and the group submitted to Lily. Uh, and it says, the theological education between times project begins with a yes and a no. The no, and we've heard this now from Ted, is to sort of reductively managerial solutions to the epical change in theological education. But what caught me was the yes. The yes of the project grows out of a trust that theological education will continue because God wants to be known. And I thought, wow, that's the vision that I've, that I've needed. Um, that vision uh, makes sense of the joy uh, and the place of um, even amidst uh, traumas that we can get into um, the joys that drew me to theological education. Um, and it gave me that hope. Um, again, it restored to me that hope that this, uh, this experience of, of um, making God known and um, seeing God in theological education is something that we can continue to build into. And so just a project that invited more of us to, to catch that vision, to catch that hope. And from that hope, um, to meet the current challenges and the current climate in, in theological education. I thought that's, this is the place 
Um, but I should tell you two other things really quick. Um, so that hopefulness, uh, uh, yeah, was what drew me in. But then there's also this uh, sense, especially in phase three of the project, um, that there's no dissemination of information. This is not about finding one or two or eight models that then we figure out which one fits for, for whom. This is the, again, about leaning into the fact, the hope that God longs to be known. And so that wherever people are gathered wondering what is next for us? And that was crucial to me, the contextuality of that. Um, and that that happens in communities. That that is not, that, that discerning God's presence is not something that I do on my own when I reflect back or even in my monastic space and my retreat. Retreat happens, yes, and it's a crucial part. But also I get to see God when I am around other folks who are also from different points, also looking out for God. Um, and that friendship, uh, that, that kind of shared task fosters and that in conjunto, way of looking for God, um, I think is crucial to, to the years ahead. Yeah, the spaces that TEBT has kind of created for those kinds of discernments and conversations has been powerful for me as well. So thank you for reflecting on that. Ted, could you say a little bit more about that yes and that no? Um, I've heard you both talk about managerial logic um, here and of course in other spaces, but for folks that might not know what we're talking about, how does that show up in institutions as they're thinking about theological education? Yeah, I think one way it shows up is where, uh, where we think about everything that we're doing as a means to some other end. So uh, why, would you, uh, why would you offer an MDiv? Well, you would offer an MDiv to... Um, attract more students. Well, why would you attract more students you, uh, so that you can have more tuition revenue? Well, why do you need more tuition revenue? Well, you need more tuition revenue so you can have more faculty. Well, why do you need more faculty? Anyway, but, but it never kind of, you get these means to ends. Um, and even, I think, I think that kind of instrumental thinking where everything is a means to some other end, it can really swallow the whole of theological education. Um, but I think to me, like the, the joy of theological education, and, the, and joy is a big part of this, uh, mm -hmm. but it is, it is communion with God, right? It is a knowing God. And that is not a means to something else. Like that's an end, that's what it's all about, right? And so what does it mean to uh, cultivate those kind of moments in theological education that are not necessarily for anything else? Because I think when everything is instrumental, it, um, it leads to this very busy despair um, that I think is one of the hallmarks of our time. Uh, so I don't want us to play into that, right? I want us to be able to incarnate another way of being. Mm -hmm. And that logic has such a hold on, even on me. On all oh, me, me yeah. too. Yeah. I mean, I worry about it. You know, we're running a program here, right? <laughs> we, have, like, we have like deliverables and outcomes and stuff. Um, but, uh, but I think, you know, one of the gifts for me is that, uh, in a way you could, if, if it's not too, um, too pious to say, but it's a way in which God breaks through that, you know? And I think, um, yes, I turn in my annual report every year on time with a bunch of deliverables. And, but I all, but the moments when the program is really alive are when um, Willie Jennings preaches a sermon on almost off the cuff on joy, and it's not about joy, but we are all rejoicing, like in the moment. What is that? You know, in a in an ugly conference room at a hotel, you know, and it, it just, but it happened and it's fire. It's uh, transforming. Or when Elizabeth Conde Frazier just like break, it's almost like breaking a wall of uh, intensity with her integrity. And she just is like, this is what it's all about and do not deviate, you know, but that kind of strong, it's, it's being called to account. Uh, if, and it feels like an encounter. It is, it is a, a meeting of God in a way in that moment. 
And it's not for, yes, it changes everything that happens afterwards, but it's not for the sake of something else. Like that moment is a moment of communion that is infinitely valuable. And those things just kept, have kept happening in this project. So it's yeah. been, that's been a gift. Thank you for that. I mean, it's, it's funny, you would think right now, so many conversations about theological education end up being kind of despairing. <laughs> and yeah. that this project for me, what you just named has been one of the surprises for me is that it's so full of joy, even though it doesn't shy away from the hard questions about moments of crisis, but it's shot through with that true joy of people who really are reflecting more deeply on these purposes and ends of theological education. Um, Lucila, I'm, I'm interested, especially for our listeners and friends um, that are part of the Hispanic Theological Initiative, all of our supporters, our comunidad large um, of, of primos and primas to our community as well, and how, it, how this work connects with so many of our commitments as theologians to, as you said earlier, to our work as um, theologians in conjunto, um, so, so much of it seems to be deeply related to this work. I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, I have too many thoughts, that might be the problem. Uh, but first I have to say, I'm coming to you with my matecito. So What's you, your mate? So, <laughs> but, uh, well, one of the things with Zoom is we can each have our little uh, drink of conversacion. Of you no, know, it's, it's funny whenever anyone speaks about like a pan Latino identity, I'm like, you can't even get past coffee without <laughs> a conversation <laughs> about differences <laughs> or beans or whatever. So yeah, the mate yeah. is like a signal of who you are. So, uh, you know, one of the, the gifts that I've been taking from this project is the opportunity to press into some of the commitments that um, Latinx theologians have already invited us to, to yeah. create, um, like, you know, being in conjunto, like contextuality, um, and really, and, and yeah, just really press into them. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges that I have um, in trying to speak um, or to do theology uh, contextually is that contextuality can become really abstract. So that, you know, whenever I think that I'm doing contextual theology, um, I actually might just be saying, talking about context as this thing that always actually yields the same message. Right. Um, and um, just the possibility of thinking about what does it mean to be good, to bring a group of different, really different people together um, <clears throat> and invite them to speak from their contexts without their context being reduced to a moment or to a, to a concept or to a whatever, uh, uh, but that their, their voice and their context can come into the room over a long period of time um, mm -hmm. and be wrestled to and uh, with and, and um, appreciated and sometimes overlooked and then found again um, among friends. Uh, that is something that I need to bring back to my, to your point, to my Latin American theologizing. Um, when I get together with Latinx or Latin American theologians, there is no Latin American context. Um, and so it, is, um, it, it, it helps me to press into that again that commitment and figure out how might that work. Um, the, um, the other thing that, I'm, that I've been thinking about is, there's a divide that I often find in education, especially in Argentina. It might be elsewhere too, but in Argentina I have found it, um, where when we step into the classroom, we inhabit these uh, very colonial hierarchical um, modes of being. Um, and the moment that we step out of the classroom, we're back to being friends and we're back to the joy and we're back to the, to like mm -hmm. lifelong commitments to one another that invigorate us. But the stepping into the classroom becomes um, mm -hmm. a, a moment of letting go of those things that really animate us. And it's not, it's, it's not a straightforward let go of the curriculum and now be friends in the classroom. Because I need the classroom to be a different moment than the moment of cafecito or matecito with my friends. 
But what is that classroom experience? What is that moment of thinking together, discerning together, um, uh, thinking in traditions, thinking um, uh, with authors long gone? How do I do that as friends and with friends and in ways that bring life? Um, so that's, that's another mode. I'll tell you a third. <laughs> and this goes to, um, I have been reading the, the books that are coming out in the TVT um, book series. Um, and in each of them, I, you know, some of the authors um, like Elizabeth Conde Fraser and Hosman Espino come from the Latinx community. Um, but so far, the authors that have been published have not come from the Latinx, Latinx community. And in each one, I think, uh, man, I've, I've really been needing to think about this. I've really been needing to think about diasporic education. Like, this is crucial for the Latinx community. And Chloe Sun is taking us through that, um, uh, thinking through that. Mark Jordan is thinking about shelters for theological education when institutions um, uh, die or not enough, right? Oh, shelters for theological education. That's what institutions like CETI, where I've come from, the Comunidad de Estudios Teológicos Interdisciplinarios out of Costa Rica, has been trying to do, make shelters for theological education. And so we have all of these folks coming from many different contexts who are giving us um, their, their insight, their wisdom into realities that are pressing for us. So I just find that really invigorating. Yeah, thank you for that. It reminds me too of like one of the hallmarks of this project to me is the deep plurality, the deep diversity of it. And you know, that phrase gets tossed out a lot in our fields, but I really see it all the way through this project. And it it appears not just in the people who are a part of the project, but as as Ted, you were saying earlier, those places we met. I mean, it was surprising that this grant first met at Saddleback. It was perhaps surprising that it met at Mundelein, a Catholic seminary where we sat in the same room and ate lunch with all of the Catholic seminarians um, when you might expect it to be at a you know, hotel ballroom or something. And that was not by accident. But also I see the diversity in, in the forms, in the genres and all of the ways that this, this um, thinking about theological education, you're, you're kind of like breaking open the boundaries of what counts. And so I'm wondering if you could talk, Ted, about that, that commitment to plurality that just pervades the project and, and why you see it as so central to this work. Yeah, um, there there are like there are high-minded reasons for the pluralism of it. I think one of the maybe maybe this is high-minded too, but uh, one reason is is that it's just more fun. Um, it's delightful. Better food uh, for sure. Well, it's better food, but it, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, no doubt. <laughs> but it's also it is just more fun to be in these different kinds of spaces. But it's also more. And I mean fun in a kind of, I'm in a serious way, but also in the just in the mundane way. Um, it's good to be together. It's good to be together in ways that uh, honor that difference. I'm really I'm wary of uh, diversity talk as a kind of, uh, if you'll forgive the jargon, but it can you can get sucked into a kind of neoliberal. Uh, uh, mask in a way that has individuals who uh, are marked with different identities that and, that get assimilated to a power structure that doesn't change at all and that still replicates whiteness. Um, I'm super, uh, I, I'm concerned about that and I want to make sure we don't do that. Um, so part of that has, part of that is sharing power, <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, just that a lot of people have had a chance to shape this. Um, part of it is is attending to space, um, which itself was a suggestion from uh, a minoritized member of the original planning team. He knew how much space mattered. Um, and then part of it is in the way people write. And that actually, it took all of us a while to kind of shake off um, the strictures of academic prose and to kind of find the ways in which we needed to, like, how did we need to write in order to say what we really had to say? And so the books really vary on this. Um, the very first book in this series, uh, Willie Jennings, After Whiteness, it, it has poems. It has uh, lightly 
uh, lightly disguised ethnography or lightly anonymized ethnography. It has visions, it has, it has dreams, and it's full of theology and critical social analysis. Um, and that's just the one book. But we have, uh, uh, we have autoethnography, there are memoirs, there's more speculative theology, there's history. So there's a, I, uh, my book has a sermon at the middle of it. So there's all these different genres. And I, I, part of that, I, I, genres are a lot about, they're about power, they're political, because it, uh, the mode of speech is authorizing. So one thing we wanted to do here is to authorize more speakers, which means authorizing more modes of speech. And that includes more languages. Um, so the books, so some of the books will come out in uh, both English and Spanish. Some will come out in English and one will come out in English and Mandarin. We're hoping for broader translation um, plans as things go on. So it's about uh, those, it, it's about a, the, the genres matter politically, but they also matter theologically, I think, because uh, there's no separating how we talk about God and what we have to say um, to or with or from or uh, about God. So these have to be seeded with prayer and ecstatic speech and visions and theologically inflected memoirs, because these are the ways that we bear witness to what God is doing in the world. So um, I think it also just happens to make the books a lot more fun to read. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, the, and they are. And I think part of it is because they're, they're real. You know, people, we really wanted people to speak out of um, deeply particular places, not trying to offer an overview from everywhere for everyone. Um, yeah. And, and I think they keep that promise. It's, it's been fun to see how people do it. I might tag along to that um, that word testimony um, or witness. I think um, Tony, uh, we might speak soon about phase three, but I think this is one of the exciting things to me about the relationship between phase two and phase three about these books and what's coming up next for the project and what we hope these books do for others, um, even if they don't get in touch with the project, um, which is these. Um, books of witness um, are meant to spark more bearing witness mm -hmm. so okay. that uh, those who read them can say, this is, this is your story. Here's my story. Mm -hmm. uh, here's, here's how I have seen God. Here's how I have missed God. Um, here's um, what I have to bring uh, to this, to this uh, shared project. And um, yeah, I think that's a, a really crucial gift that these books um, offer uh, in, the, in their own genres that they invite us to then speak in our own rhetorical language, um, what God has done for us. Yeah, I, I definitely felt that invitation in uh, Willie Jennings book, um, not here's, I'm writing this poetry, so you should also write poetry, but who are you? <laughs> you know, how, what, is, what is being called forth um, in you? And also the ways that book um, kind of blurs those very boundaries you were talking about, Lucila, about the classroom and how we are outside of the classroom, okay. um, which I think are worth tending to, right? It's the after yes. the faculty meeting conversations. It is, the, it is the conversations over mate or over something better <laughs> at the bar. <laughs> hey. there, are, um, there are things that, that uh, are, are true about those things. And I think Willie's book testifies that in a particular way from his context, but also opens us to deeper conversations and attentiveness to those things um, in our own contexts. So what is next? I mean, as we move forward, and if, if folks who are um, listening today are interested in getting engaged with, um, with uh, TEBT in phase three and beyond, what, what, what are the possibilities here beyond reading the books? Mm -hmm. So I'll share a few and then I'll see if Ted has any others to offer. But um, one uh, thing that uh, folks can do beyond reading the books is to, or even before reading the books, is to come to our website, um, which is, uh, well, I'm sure we'll put it on the HDI uh, page for this podcast, but tvd.candler.emory.edu. 
and they can see the events coming up. We have been going to um, visit with the Louisville Institute. We have been with Trust Y Stewards. We will be with AET. Um, and so folks uh, can have an opportunity to connect to the project at these events. Uh, but we also are um, hoping to go to communities who would like to have us uh, catalyze critical theological conversations about the, the purposes of theological education. Um, and um, through uh, Lily's uh, generous gift, we have the funds to go to communities who might not think that they are able to bring speakers um, like the folks who are uh, in the in the project. And so, uh, yeah, I invite um, communities, churches, schools, whoever to come to our website and let us know that they would like to speak more uh, with our fellows. It's a beautiful website. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's all the credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> and the artists on those images, just good for those images. It matters, it matters. Ted, what about you? What would you like to see from folks who are interested in engaging with this project as it moves forward? Yeah, um, I, I'd second Lucila's call to, to uh, invite us. Um, and especially if you, if you don't usually invite people, uh, invite, this, is, this is a case where just as she says, we can pay the travel and the honoraria for, who you, for these folks. So I think that's, I'm really hoping that can catch fire. Uh, so then it's a meeting that you host, right? And uh, I think a lot of this work is best, it's, it's the attending to the power and the contextuality again. It, a lot of this work is best done as guests instead of as the host who has the power to convene, but as a guest. So let us be your guest, invite us. Um, we are gonna convene some meetings. Um, and so if you would like to be part of those and you wanna write us and say, oh, uh, please invite me, that would be great. Um, and I think other, we, we're gonna be trying to, we, we'll, we'll have some more collections of writing that I expect will come out. The shape of those is really gonna determine on what people write. Um, but if people wanna, if people read things and they wanna write in response, um, I'd, we'd love to read it uh, and write from where you are in your own voice in that particularity. Um, so writing, joining a meeting, uh, inviting, all those are ways that people can connect. Excellent. Well, Ted and Lucila, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been wonderful for me. This project has been so meaningful for me and anytime I get invited to do anything that touches it, if I can, I say yes. And um, I, I continue to learn so much. Uh, and as a person that's kind of entering the academy at the time that this project started, it's really a blessing to me to think more deeply about what, what matters most to me about this work. Because as, as y'all said, like that, that pull towards other ends comes fast and furious. And so if you don't create spaces for alternative ways of thinking, it's hard um, work. So I'm grateful for this conversation and for all you're doing for our community. I hope our HDI folks will, will engage and, and take um, Ted and Lucila up on the invitation to get involved with this project because I think it really matters. So thank you all so much. Thank, thank you, you, Tony. This has been an HTI production. For more information, visit us at htiopenplaza.org. The Hispanic Theological Initiative provides Open Plaza as a public service. The views expressed by the guests are their own. Their appearance on this program or any reference to a specific product or entity they represent does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by HTI.